Hello. Is that? Oh, hold on. Thought I was ready. That's just the conference website. You guys have all seen that. All right. Hello. Uh, I'm John Brown, and I just want to say a quick thank you to the organizers uh, for putting this on. This is great. This is my first time in Berlin. I'm really enjoying myself. And uh, thanks to the sponsors for all of you guys being here, being a part of the community. And if you're watching this on YouTube later, hello. Um, what I'm here to talk about is I found a way to center content both horizontally and vertically in a simple and semantically correct way. No, 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 that's a lie. That's a lie. Total joke. Absolutely kidding. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> what I am here to talk to you guys about is a little something that we created earlier in the year uh, using just CSS 3D. So I just pulled this up, and I'll walk you guys through it. But this is just one element flying around in the page, and you can see the. I've got a laser, too. You've, you can see the just transform is going crazy over here. So I'll definitely walk you guys through that. And, so yeah, how we made it, how we came to it, and everything. So here's the agenda. I'll talk to you guys about uh, my, or, uh, my part with Google I.O. Uh, I'll show you guys the experiment, tell you about how we made it, the good things and the bad things, and I've got an announcement at the end. So CSS 3D, hopefully you guys, since you guys are at a CSS conference, you guys at least have basic understanding, uh, just of, of, again, of the simple basics. And if you don't, this is a colleague of mine who was at CSS Conf US last year. Uh, he gives a great talk about the basics. And if you're on YouTube, click here. Maybe they'll put a link to annotation in there. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so Google I.O., an instrument. This is where I work. I'm a technical director there. We're a creative agency, and we have a lot of really cool clients. We're about 100 people or so. And um, we actually work in an old shipbuilding a ship building building, which is really awesome if you guys want to look that up. We've been doing work with Google, with Google for about five years, and uh, I think we've done over 100 projects with them of varying sizes, from really small to really large. And in particular, we have a really good relationship with the I.O. team. And so if you guys don't know what I.O. is, it is an annual developer conference that Google puts on where they bring in developers and they show them new hardware, new software, uh, APIs. And the... Uh, the year that we started this is in uh, 2011, and before the registration day, a couple months before that, we put up a teaser trailer, and it's an experimental website that sort of gets people ready for the conference. So the first one we did was a countdown clock, and these pieces would burst apart and they'd bounce around with physics. That was when physics was still super rad, sort of old school now. Uh, and then the next year, we continued the physics path. We made uh, some games with levels. You create your own and send them to your friends. Last year, we rebranded it completely, and we had a binary game where you had to enter in codes that you sort of had to figure out or look on Hacker News or whatever to unlock levels uh, like cat mode. Every website needs a cat mode. So 2014 rolls around. We're in, it's January. We have to go back to the drawing board, do some brainstorming, some prototyping. Google is really great about letting us come to them with ideas and then saying, roll with it. So they only had a couple things that they wanted us to keep in mind. This year, they wanted it to be mobile first. That's just the way of the web. Uh, more people are using mobile primarily than ever before, and that's only going to go up. They're also trying to expand it to not just be for developers. They want to make, uh, make it available for tech enthusiasts and especially designers. So they didn't want it so nerdy. We've got binary games, physics puzzles, keep it a little bit more open. So when we were looking through, getting inspiration, doing prototypes, we rediscovered the Eames Powers of 10. So if you guys don't know what this is, it's a series of videos. It's actually two videos. Is two videos a series? We'll assume that is. That came out in 1977 that takes place, uh, starts at a human scale, it slowly zooms out, and it takes in, encompasses all of the universe and what we understand about it. This is be slowly zooming out. And then, once it gets to the universe and tells you all the fun facts about the galaxies, it zooms back down past the human scale, and then it tells you basically the understanding of the smallest bits that we understood in 1977, down to particles and guessing about subatomic particles. So we want to take this idea of a uh, sort of a journey from the micro to the macro. And since Google I.O. is annual, 
wanted to include a year in review of tech and science and the things that Google are doing and acquisitions that they've made. So let's take a look at it. A lot of you guys have probably already seen this, but this is about a 45 second version of it. Uh, when you actually go and check it out, you click and you move and you can solve puzzles to go through it. But this is a very quick version of it. Just want to show you guys it working. There's a lot of interesting pieces that go into this. So this is an icosahedron uh, that has 20 sides representing the 20 subatomic particles. And they're color coded to be leptons or bosons or whatever. Uh, we were very deliberate in, in, in uh, making the choices that we made. So this is the first chapter, subatomic. It pulls up into an atomic level. It's a representational of a silicon molecule and advancements that were made in microprocessors. Then we look, go up into a human-ish scale to look at some neural networks and visual data learning. RX, uh, RX robot that uh, Google sort of acquired when they bought Google, uh, Boston Dynamics last year. This is a nod to the history of communication, Google Fiber, and the history of what Google is going to be sort of representing. And then Voyager just left the solar system last year. Uh, it's no longer being inundated with solar wind, so hopefully it's off to discover really rad things in our universe. And then back to the beginning. So that was all in CSS 3D. I showed you guys that before. You can click on any of those elements, explore it, see the transforms that are happening. But the thing that people keep asking us is, why did we do it in CSS 3D? That's where I show you the demo. How do we get to CSS 3D? Why not do it in WebGL? WebGL is awesome. Uh, you can do shaders and post-processing and a lot of really cool things, but it's just not ready for mobile. It's only just now going on iOS 8 next week, I think. Uh, it's sort of hit or miss on the native Android browser. And Chrome for Android, you have to enable it explicitly, I think. I'm not sure if that's still valid, but why not Canvas? The things that we were running into were it's too slow. Your phone doesn't have as much processing power, obviously, as your laptop or your desktop. So we knew that when we were doing our prototypes, it just wasn't going to cut it. So we turned to CSS 3D. One, everything can run it, and we can have fallbacks for it. We knew it was going to be a big challenge. We hadn't used it in such an interesting experimental way before. And all the transitions get sloughed off onto the GPU. So what does that mean? So the CPU versus the GPU. So the CPU that you've got it has a few cores, but they're super powerful, and they can do all the calculations that you want. But the problem gets, uh, that sort of like gets you is that when you need to go paint those onto the screen, all those cores are still being used to do all the calculations, so you can get really janky animations. The GPU has a ton of cores, and they're not as powerful, and basically their sole purpose is to just paint on the screen. So you can separate the logic from the actual drawing, and you can get super smooth animations. So you guys saw this on, uh, up on the big screen, and we'll show you guys it on mobile. I actually think it runs better on mobile, and we didn't do anything to it. We just, uh, it's the exact same experience um, with, you know, you can pinch and zoom on it. This is a quick CSS trick for you guys. This may be the only practical information that I give you other than just sort of talking about the project. So if you are using uh, transitions and you're running into problems where you're fading and sliding and things start to get a little uh, uh, chuggy, you can just turn it into a 3D transform, and this will put it onto the GPU. It'll smooth everything out. It is a really great trick that I've used in a ton of places, and you can actually take that home, use that tonight. So write it down, but I'll also remind you later. And don't forget prefixes. So pure CS is, is awesome, and I would love to have had this whole thing just be in CSS 3D alone. I love going to CodePen and looking at all the rad projects and seeing that JS panel with nothing in it. Uh, but we knew we had state we had to take care of, we had interactions, we had a lot of really weird things that we knew we were going to need to do. So we use 3JS, which is by far my favorite piece of JavaScript. And a lot of people don't know that it has a CSS 3D renderer where it can do the calculations and then directly apply those uh, output as animations to your elements. Everybody knows about the WebGL and the Canvas, and if you've ever used those, the syntax is super similar, so you can actually go home and start trying it out. If you don't know, this is as easy as it gets. You add a camera, you add a scene, you start rendering that scene. That's, that is how you get started. But like I said, we had a lot of state we needed to keep track of. We had transitions. If you go look at it, it's got sound. 
So we, named, so we created a framework, and we named it after Carl Sagan. Uh, you saw Voyager in there, and I've always wanted to name something after Carl Sagan, so this is my chance. We created it. It's got 9,200 lines of SAS and JavaScript. I don't know if that means anything in today's society, but that's a lot of lines uh, for mostly just two people working on it. Um, it controls the state, the sounds, and the transitions. And just to show you guys a, a very like, high-level version of what that is, so for the icosahedron that you saw in that first boson chapter, you create your class, and this inherits behaviors and transitions. And then you create your chapter, and then you add those entities that can then also have entities inside of them. And then you put it in the chapter stack, and then you walk through it, those powers of 10. All right, let's talk about the really cool shit. Oh, really cool things that we did. I wasn't going to swear. <laughs> um, so we wanted to make these 2D citizens living in this 3D world uh, look like origami. We wanted to give them some character and some depth. So any entity that's on the page, any element, we can call foldable on it. And it duplicates that content and then translates it, makes it half the width, and then puts them back together so they look sort of move around like a book. You guys saw a little bit of that. It moved really fast. So you can also assign patterns to them. And then so that one on the very right is flipping through the CSS conf colors uh, really simply. But you can fold it, blink it. Uh, it originally had the ability that you could uh, rotate it on different axes, but we ended up not using it, so I stripped it out. This is a lot of fun to do, and it took a lot of trial and error. And there's some things that I can talk to you about why that is. So elements don't really understand physics. They, they don't bounce around if you say bounce. They don't understand the lights. You can add a shadow to them, but that's kind of dumb. It doesn't really, uh, it doesn't, not dumb. It's like, it, it's unintelligent. So <laughs> we ended up adding, uh, expanding that shadow information. We use box shadow when we could. We use drop shadow when we could as well. And sometimes we would just duplicate those divs, flood them in color, and then shift them around. Sorry. So the one on the right is rotating, and it's had, it has the CSS transform applied to its shadow that's running around in the background. And what that looks like if it were sort of standing still and just that shadow is rotating is, is on the left. So whenever you needed to apply uh, an animation to an element, you'd also apply that offset by whatever that dimensionality is, and then put it back on the, and then put it on that shadow. This made us be able to ground all these elements in this huge white world and really added a lot of depth. And I increased the color on these shadows so, so they would pop out at you. Shading is awesome. And again, doesn't really work because your CSS elements don't understand what that is. What we ended up doing is using a concept from you know, game theory where you've got your plane and you've got a normal, which if you guys don't know what that is, it's the perpendicular point coming off of the flat surface. You can use that to calculate uh, how much light or reflection something should have. And we ended up using the brightness filter, again, where we could, to, as things were moving away from the camera, adjust that brightness. I'll show that again. So these are just a couple of items that are sort of floating around in space, or these pages are flipping. It's not as easy as just adding a rotation Y to it, uh, or checking what the rotation Y is, and then adding that percentage, because as with, you see with this guy, it's already at a 45 degree angle. So if we were using the same 45 degree, 45 degree angle as this, when it was at 90 degrees, it'd be all black. But that's not what you want because the light is coming from the front. So we used uh, 3JS to calculate. We'd walk up that parent tree, figure out where the plane was actually facing, and then we would apply our uh, brightness to it. And the weird thing about brightness is that one is actually like all black which doesn't make sense to me. We also created an SVG compiler uh, in much the same way as you'd create a, a JavaScript or CSS one, a CSS minifier. It would put it all into a JSON blob that you can then add them in line and, uh, and adjust the view box and apply it and figure out exactly that entity size and the fluidity of it. One of the things that it's hard to do with SVGs in a situation like this is if you want to have a clipping mask and it 
it looks at the ID. If you've got two of the entities that are using the same uh, SCG information, you start animating the clip path on this one, and it's using the ID to, to view that clip path. This one's also going to react because it's looking for that ID. So that sort of cascades down. So whenever we added an SVG in line, we ended up creating a unique ID for every element that needed an ID inside of that SVG when we put it in line. So we didn't have those conflicts when we were doing animations or clip paths. <clears throat> Another triumph is it runs like a dream. Uh, we had so many people who only ever saw it on mobile tell us that they, they thought it was a video, they couldn't understand why it was moving so fast. And again, the <clears throat> we didn't degrade the experience, it just runs super great because of that GPU-CPU separation. This is a home run for us. This is, we really nailed the mobile-first aspect of the project. I just closed my slides. <laughs> Hold on. All right, I'm going to vamp for a second while I pull this up. Does this count as computer trouble? I'm going to say this counts as computer trouble. Also, slash IO. We were on Google.com, not even a subdomain, slash two letters, and probably the most two recognizable letters in computer science. It's a super humbling experience to work with those guys this year, and I'm really proud of the whole project. Also, my wife made uh, exoplanet cookies for us for our launch, and <laughs> they were really delicious. So those are the good things that we did. And what went wrong? Plenty always goes wrong. That is just a fact of every project. Uh, so, what are some of the big ones? Intersection was oil and water. Divs in 3D space, we saw, didn't really want to interact. So these two elements are sitting exactly on top of each other, and then rotated a little bit, and they're inside of a parent div that then is rotated, just so you can see the dimensionality of it. So it doesn't really look like what we'd expect. We'd expect these two things to be interacting and intersecting with each other. So if we just move this one back in Z space, now all of a sudden the water's in front. The so oil and the water, they're not mixing. We designed around this. Uh, we made sure that the experience didn't involve any intersecting divs. Oh, I almost closed all of Chrome that time. Oh, wait, no, that's fine. I can close that one. Leave this page. But. We developed in Chrome, not because it was a Google project, it's that's what we prefer to develop in, but you gotta make sure to check your other browsers, and here's why. Oil and water mixing. It's making an emulsion. What does this even mean? Uh, so these two, this is the exact same uh, code pen that I just showed you guys. Let's make, an, let's, let's make this animate. So these are actually moving into and out of each other super fluidly. And we discovered this shortly after we started designing around all the intersection aspects. So I used to not be the person that would read specs, but now I am, and, here's, and this is one very good reason why. Um, what is happening? We'll open this up again. That's, this is in Safari. I should have had jokes ready for this. Respect the spec. Uh, Safari is actually correct. So this is a supporting doc from the, from the specs of what should happen when two things intersect in 3D space. So when two elements intersect, you split it, and essentially you have now four pieces that you need to draw. So the orange gets split, the blue gets split, and then it uses an algorithm to determine what needs to be drawn first. So the skinny orange, and then the left blue, or the right blue, and the orange in the back. So just be aware of this. You guys probably won't run into 
weird intersecting elements very often. Uh, but if you're trying to do something weird and experimental, this is definitely something to be aware of. I put this slide in here because I was afraid it's going to be the only one complaining about Internet Explorer, but I think we're potentially like five for f five for five. So Preserve 3D is essentially what makes these 3D worlds possible. It's not supported in IE 10. And so what it does is if you have an element and you rotate it 45 degrees, you put it inside of a parent element, you rotate that 45 degrees, it should now be at 90 degrees. But there's not the ability to have that preserve 3D transform in IE. It, uh, so what does this look like? It's a little weird to describe. So it's, this is a render from, uh, in, from Internet Explorer. It's sort of like an MC Escher painting where you've got dimensionality and you expect things to go behind each other, but they're actually going in front. Especially if you're trying to control it, it's just a little disorienting. So let it wash over you guys. So how do we get around that? Actually, first, uh, it'll be in IE 11. So don't worry. Nope, never mind. Not in IE 11. It's actually still in development, despite the fact it's been in every browser for really quite a while. That's just an issue. So Microsoft suggests that you take your element that you want to be 3D transformed and you walk up the stack and you calculate all of the transitions and the rotations and then add them together and then apply it. It's super, super high. Uh, it's super expensive. It takes a lot of work. But thankfully, uh, 3JS has an explicit renderer for IE that only does that. It doesn't run as great, but people in using Internet Explorer just sort of expect that thing. So <laughs> make, sure, make sure that you put a switch statement in here. Another thing is that we're not using WebGL, so you can't just throw 100,000 entities on your stage. We ran into about issues when we were pushing around 70 or so, and that depends on the complexity of with their like, super dense SVGs or anything like that. So if you guys are starting to explore around with this, uh, no amount of putting it into 3D will help you because you're already in 3D, so you may get some janky uh, animations. And the last one isn't really code-based. Uh, but I remember the very first time we were ready to start having somebody sort of use the experience. So we had the silicon, the second chapter already, and I put it in somebody's hands, and I sort of like took a step back, and I watched them take the phone and go, mm. and they just swiped it and it spun, and they were like, cool, and it had sound to it. They swipe it, and it spun, and swipe, 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 spin, spin, spin. And they just stood there, and I'm thinking, click it, just click it to progress down the journey. And then they paused did the thing that we all dread. They looked me in the eye, and they said, I think it's broken. And I was just like, oh, OK, it's not broken, but we made it broken. Um, we, when we made this journey, we wanted it to be self-exploratory. So it didn't say click here or have a play button. And you sort of felt like you were a part of the world and un, 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 uh, unraveling it and going through it. But the problem with that is that users need these, uh, these paradigms and these shorthands that we've given them over all these years, because some people aren't explorers, and they'll get to a page, and they'll be like, I don't know what to do here, close. And the only reason this young lady actually continued to swipe it is because I was you know, hovering over her and being like, well, how do you like it? So if you do do things that are really experimental, make sure that you have a way that the user can enjoy it, no matter what their level of comfort is with exploration. We went back to the drawing board, and you can go through the, whole, uh, through the whole experience using swipe, tap, pinch, uh, click. Essentially, anything you do to it will progress the journey, but you feel like everything you're doing is intuitive, so you get this like, dopamine hit of like, oh, I'm actually exploring this world and I'm doing it correctly. And there's no barriers to entry. So again, not something you guys will probably see on a day-to-day -day basis, but if you do sort of experiment with these things, just be aware of these paradigms that we've put in place for a reason. OK, you guys are thinking, is he going to close this browser again? But you guys are probably also thinking, he made an SVG compiler. That's cool. And there's these foldable entities, but he's got, he's got cookies. And how, how do I get access to any of these things? Well, the cookies are gone. We ate those. But the, when I was talking to, see, uh, to the people at Google about coming here and talking to you guys, they said, oh, do you guys want to open source it? So we said, yeah. 
I've never worked with Google in a capacity where they've said, just take it and give away the code. Uh, and it's super awesome. So I want to say thank you to them in case they're watching this. Yeah. So that's up on the instrument uh, repo. You can go to it here. And uh, you can compile it, change it, add some new levels, some new powers of 10 steps if you want to. Just let me know if you do anything interesting with it. OK, I'm nearing the end of my talk. What are some takeaways from this? I didn't give you guys a lot of code examples. So here's the four things you should walk away with. CSS 3D is mobile friendly. You should be using it. It is awesome. Translate 3D code uh, to unjink your transitions in 2D if you're ever having an issue with that. Beware intersections in 3D space. Make sure that you, at least at this point, plan on things not intersecting correctly in most browsers. And watch your users and learn from them from the very beginning. You want to make sure that as you go down these paths that you're creating something that everybody can enjoy. So thank you to you guys all for listening. Uh, thank you on YouTube for making it all the way through. Uh, I'm John Brown, at This Is John Brown. These slides will be up on slides.com slash This Is John Brown. I'm ungoogleable, but if you search for This Is John Brown, this is how you can find me. Uh, so let's, let's go have lunch, everybody. All right, thanks, guys. <laughs>